Welcome to the first session of the Green Hub Dialogues. COVID-19 has triggered a complete breakdown in the world as we know it. It has flattened all notions of power, wealth, and security, and brought us down to examine the absolute essentials of survival, health, and well-being of the human race, as well as the planet. Today, we are fortunate to have with us Dr. Prashant Ennis, a medical doctor and birder who specializes in public health and has worked extensively with rural communities around wildlife protected areas in Karnataka and Arunachal Pradesh. He is an India Alliance Fellow and a research lead at the Institute of Public Health Bangalore and works on health equity and evaluation of health programs and policies. Dr. Prashant leads the COVID-19 PHC Action Group a collective of medical professionals working on COVID-19 preparedness and response at the rural level. He is also an editor and contributor to Wikipedia and teaches online courses on public health. This is a very, very busy time for you, Prashant. Thank you so much for joining us for this Green Hub Dialogue. So today in our brief conversation, we would like to understand better how zoonotic viruses cross ecological boundaries to impact humans, how public perception often holds animals and wildlife to blame for these diseases. Thanks for that introduction, Shivani. And I think I'm, uh, I'm very happy to speak to uh, an audience that is not necessarily involved in immediate health response, but is as concerned about the pandemic. Um, and one thing that's very different, as you noted in your introduction about this pandemic is, in some sense, affects all of us. Uh, zoonosis, I think, have been a phenomena for uh, centuries. What has clearly changed um, in the last few decades has been the newer kinds of zoonosis that we have begun to see. And this has to do with the rapidity with which we are opening up ecosystems. The ultimate drivers appears to be the rapid way in which we are uh, changing the interface between uh, the human world and many other uh, cycles of uh, pathogens. So who is to blame? Yeah, for example, the Nipah virus outbreak um, involved bats. And uh, earlier there was the whole issue of bird flu. And now we, we are, there's lots of media reports on possibly the virus uh, crossing over from bats through probably intermediate hosts like a pangolin or uh, some other species onto humans. So do we now respond by saying, okay, look out, we need to be beware of bats. That would be a very superficial way of responding to the whole issue of um, zoonosis. So I think the ultimate message is that we need to carefully understand, monitor and interact with the natural world. And we cannot take it for granted. The specific interaction or interface which allowed this kind of jumping seems to be food market. But the epicenter seems to have been an urban location. It's not, for example, a remote forest area where it uh, jumped across and then spread uh, to cities. So ranging from veterinary public health measures like um, animal handling, animal handlers, occupational safety and things for them, to uh, monitoring and understanding better these cycles of uh, pathogens between wildlife and uh, uh, domesticated animals and pets and humans, us is very important. Thank you, Prashant. You're a medical professional, you're a researcher, and you're a wildlife enthusiast. And these are three sectors which we don't normally see as necessarily connected to each other. But in some ways, this particular crisis is really throwing up the interlinkings and connections. So could you just elaborate? COVID-19 is, of course, the most recent crisis, but we have not been short of crises. Uh, take, for example, climate change. Take, for example, air pollution. So all of these problems, in fact, in literature, they are called wicked problems. Wicked because of the complexity surrounding um, how we need to figure out their solutions. Why are these wicked problems? They are wicked problems because they challenge our very narrow silo based approaches that we have to many of these uh, health as well as social problems. Uh, if we look at COVID-19 as purely a medical issue, I think we are totally missing the point. So COVID-19 is as much about inequities in our society. It's as much about uh, urban rural migrations. It's as much about responsiveness of our political and social and healthcare system. 
as it is about mutations and crossovers and the pcr and all the biology around it so i think approaches or lenses which allow us to look at the system within which these problems come about are going to be very useful and in that sense um approaches like planetary health but one health is a framework that requires that for all zoonotic diseases we need to have a coordinated approach between ecologists and wildlife biologists veterinarians and human public health uh, people and if you draw a larger circle you should probably also involve people in the agriculture sector and uh, people in various other sectors as well if we want to have uh, an appropriate early response to many of these uh, illnesses we need these kind of coming together and breaking of these uh, disciplinary uh, barriers departmental barriers disciplinary barriers various kinds of barriers that we have sometime during my uh, early college days that i picked up birding and uh, you know interest in wildlife uh, etc so this i think uh, has helped me understand uh, how many of the health problems are also wicket problems and they need an understanding of multiple systems and that's why we need people coming together not only scientists but also implementers uh, politicians communities and and others right thank you prashant that really gives us that sense of an integrated approach where we are actually all one one follow up on this integrated approach um, what's interesting i mean i'm speaking to you right now from our public health research field station um, and we are located in a brt tiger reserve and if you look at um, uh any of these small towns villages uh, rural locations an integrated approach is not very difficult for people to see the way we have built up bureaucracies we lose that if you look at uh, panchayat members or uh, interact with communities they know very well that uh, deforestation is linked with uh, weather systems and that Uh, urbanization is is driving various resource extraction from their uh, neighborhoods so they see these connections because it affects their everyday life perhaps in cities the way we have insulated ourselves from the ill effects um, of our own uh, sort of uh, call it consumerism uh, perhaps because it doesn't affect our daily life and that's that's the the inequity that i was talking about earlier uh, communities that are most directly affected often pay a much higher price than many others who are far removed and have to engage through activism and understanding and you know things like that how can a lay person understand the health is not just about feeling unwell and going to a doctor and taking some medicines health is a far more far reaching uh, issue of sustainability how can we become more engaged with this wider more deep aspect of health that we are speaking about today so if you look at um, uh, the understanding of what makes someone healthy so you have one which has to do with the genes uh, that i am endowed with on which i have uh, no control and then you have a whole range of social factors the so called social determinants of health all of these social determinants they have to do entirely with how we organize our society this does not have to do with uh, biological uh, material like viruses and bacteria yes of course things like tuberculosis or covid are important biological factors that shape our health but whom they will affect and whom they will affect more whom they will affect less has to do with how in our society we have organized ourselves how well we have distributed access to healthcare how well we have distributed our health workforce you know who gets access to a private sector icu all of these will determine how one experiences health so i think this background is very important because covid is an acute crisis it hits very fast we are investing in an information sort of um, dissemination and people begin to see okay respiratory hygiene hand hygiene physical distancing will help stop this epidemic but if you ask similar questions about climate change so it's a bit more iffy there we don't know what measures we can take on a daily basis that can help us address this uh, this uh, system level problem these uh, approaches one health planetary health allow us to take into account all of these phenomena in how we shape our uh, response so it's very 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 challenging as you can see for uh, for us to be able to 
um, have practical kind of uh, uh, next steps based on these approaches. But these are a way of thinking for both, not only for professionals, but also for communities to these. I think as lay people, I think we need to start beginning to understand the interconnectedness of these many different uh, things that we seek in markets, uh, the consumerism, the, the stuff that we want in our daily lives. We need to see the interconnectedness between them, our health and various other uh, services. And only then I think together we can make a change in this. Prashant, you're saying is that uh, this particular crisis actually brings to light that we all need to live more consciously. That's very important to state, I think. We ought to be very conscious of our choices, I think. Um, that's one. That's an individual level change. But on the other hand, we need to ask for system level changes because individuals can do only so much. But for impact at this, we also need to form coalitions and ensure that the systems also change because system level change will impact much more communities than what individuals can do. To what extent do we factor in sustainability in these aspirations becomes then an important. So the, the, the way to achieve uh, our aspirations needs to also be sustainable in the long run. So only when individuals come together and then impact the system and the choices it makes, only then can we make a dent on the very large macro developments that also affect these processes. So I think it's both individual consciousness of our choices as well as coming together and demanding a change from the system. When you say about the system level change, India's population landscape, right from urban wealthy, urban poor, to migrants, to rural and farming backgrounds, to the forest dwelling and indigenous communities that you also work with. How is there a way that these systems can actually look at the really multifaceted existence levels of all these different uh, groups of people? The answer is not experts. Um, I think there is a certain uh, limitation in expertise while we talk of systems. And that's why I think coalitions and participatory uh, kind of approaches and coming together is needed. We need to move towards um, creating platforms where we can have these conversations in meaningful ways for very different communities. It's really a, a conundrum. But if we do not fix our issues of inequities and social justice, it's very difficult to talk of sustainable uh, living. Take purposely a very huge contrast between the life of an Adivasi person and the life of an average uh, Bangalorean. The, their ecological footprint is enormously different. But uh, in all our behavioral change and various other policies and strategies, we are trying to fix the, uh, the Adivasi and we are putting more and more you know, restrictions on what he, he or she can or cannot do, how she or she should live, where she should live. I think we need very, very different approaches to be able to have such conversations. Uh, this brings me to the, you equate information equity and health equity. So can you just explain mm -hmm. that very briefly? What do you mean by that? And how does it play out in India? I had been very passionate about, about more than a decade back, around 2004 or five, I started editing Wikipedia. And the fascination with being able to provide knowledge without barriers to anyone who's seeking it, um, that kind of leveling of barriers, you know, uh, uh, that you don't have to have a British library or a university library access to be able to read about, let's say, quantum physics or uh, biology of a bird, um, if you are interested. The, the internet provided such a platform that allowed that kind of equalizing, uh, that kind of, you know, information um, equity. So what if we could live in a world where health and healthcare and education, for example, would also be that way? Um, over the years, what I've realized that uh, these are not the same. Some inequities are easier to fix. So where, does, where is the parity with health equity? You feel like barrier-free access to health, you feel is... Uh... Yes, I think it's still, uh, still uh, we haven't su covered sufficient ground, I think, uh, with Ayush, one is with the National Rural Health Mission, we today uh, have made a tremendous investment of having one ASHA uh, from in each village, um, maybe not each settlement, but still, we have an ASHA system, and that, that's a lot of ground covered, uh, but yet, uh, healthcare expenditure and the uh, type of healthcare uh, that is available to some people as opposed to other, a lot of inequities remain. 
this is really a struggle that we all have to come together in and in fact with covid 19 if you look at the disparity of responses the speed with which uh, kerala is able to do contact tracing the speed with which it's able to respond to the epidemic indicates decades of investment and preparedness in public systems and that's i think the lesson we need to learn for uh, equity if we need equity in any axis uh, be it education or be it health or anything else we need to invest in public systems because these are not goods that can be traded in a market but health is not like that education is not like that so i think if there's one lesson to take away from covid 19 it's the need to fix our public systems and distribute our public systems in equitable and socially just ways that's very well put thank you prashant covid 19 and whatever it's left us with do you think we can imagine a post covid world or is it more like a living with covid covid 19 being a, a highly transmissible viral epidemic pandemic infection will come like a wave and it will go we need to look at this with a sense of proportion um humanity has seen pandemics before uh, this one is uh, also particularly unprecedented in our generation but it will pass and what will remain is still all of those wicked problems that we still haven't fixed be it uh, climate change air pollution inequity all of those poverty all of those are much more chronic problems so i think while appreciating the gravity of covid 19 we should not lose sight of those uh, complex problems that still remain and a post covid world will not be very different yes many of our social norms will change there is no doubt about it and i hope we move from social isolation to physical distancing because social isolation conveys something else as if we need to now become more individualistic and i think that's not at all the right message to take from into a post covid world if at all in a post covid world we need to be coming together perhaps keep physical distance in our interaction so um i think let me let me uh, sort of give that perspective that uh, there is going to be an end we are in the middle of it and perhaps we feel like uh, there's a monster on our backs um but this will pass um the thing is that we should ensure that while this is there we don't lose too many people eventuality is that covid might be here to stay in different ways with a vaccine with immunization whatever but crucially we will have to be prepared to take care of the sick yeah for that we have to invest in public systems in public services that was the earlier uh, comment about building vibrant robust public systems and public responses pandemic preparedness infectious disease surveillance and response are public goods um, there is no profit in them so it's not like the private sector is evil and we should keep mistrusting it but the idea is that we cannot depend on a private sector for these functions and we need to invest resources in uh, disease surveillance primary health care uh, systems rural doctors rural health workers etc through the governments and we need to support and uh, you know uh, strengthen them you had shared one thing which was very crucial is that we we cannot remain in ivory towers of protection always yeah it's very important i think somehow we are treating the lockdown as if it's some kind of a blanket and then we can keep peeking out and seeing if the monster is still there and if it's there we keep remaining under this blanket i think that's that's a wrong metaphor so the lockdown helps us improve our preparedness so if we do not use it for being better responding to that monster and facing facing whatever comes out of it we are taking the wrong message because um however well implemented your lockdown these illnesses will spread what we are able to do with the lockdown is gain some time we are able to what they call flatten that curve while we prepare ourselves prepare our communities our health systems our information systems to be able to mitigate the disasters what other aspects of preparedness do you feel needs to be rolled out what is the absolute emphasis that you feel every citizen should be aware of in terms of preparedness before we come to what we should do i think what we should not do is just absorb the huge amounts of information that comes in through whatsapp and social media and newspapers and tv channels we have to be careful we have to be critical in what we embrace in terms of uh, information so that kind of informa- misinformation epidemic has been as severe if not more than uh, covid-19 as communities i think we need to start um ensuring that we are following the various norms that prevent disease transmission and the various mitigation measures that health workers are doing are important 
in many places health workers are facing a lot of difficulties um, and often this is either due to stigma or it's some kind of religious uh, um, sort of uh, bullying and discrimination various kinds of uh, instances uh, which are very very unfavorable to do good work because of uh, various uh, prejudices etc we have so this is particularly the time where we need to reflect on our own judice and we need to come together we need to decentralize our response while the prime minister has done his part in responding uh, at the time that he did and putting us under that lockdown to slow down the trend we cannot keep relying on a high level central authority for our response we need to be we need to empower ourselves and our own neighborhoods and communities there has to be panchayat level uh, discussion and dialogue on how do we safeguard our community and our village and we need to start engaging at the grassroots level and not um, really wait for some kind of uh, centralized action you cannot keep a country under lockdown but what you can still do if the if there are too many hot spots is carefully manage smaller geographies with higher level of uh, lockdowns while allowing uh, many other geographies to proceed a bit with daily life i, I saw a photograph uh, of a migrant struggling and walking home which says because you can't go home on zoom this affects different people differently and we need to find ways in which we support the different people to overcome this pandemic what would be a key message for the young people uh, who are going to be responding to this time in the era of uh, physical distancing we need to also come together if this p- pandemic ends up making us a uh, much more uh, individualized and unitary kind of uh, divided uh, society than we already are then that's very sad um, a critical awareness where we don't consume information uncritically but we question engage and inform ourselves is uh, something very crucial for young people you know one thing that i feel is behavioral change and i think um, it's uh, as young people i think the ability to question norms that have run in families for generations in case they do not stand the test of time um, the ability to incorporate new ways of more sustainable uh, living um, and changing practices to uh, to to take into account the way our environments and our uh, societies change many of these people are shaping the next generation to come and not only the Uh, uh, they are shaping the way the, the new generation will think and i hope the thinking is about coalitions and coming together while keeping physical distancing during the epidemics and not uh, becoming more uh, individualized like i said we must act on much larger social inequalities um, and not only coming together for this uh, covid-19 and that's the challenge of the post covid-19 world thank you and all the very best to the greener fellows and i hope they can make a difference wherever they are uh, not only for covid-19 but also for a better uh, future thank you prashant thank you that's very valuable okay. thanks a lot thank you